Hi, I'm Aaron Freeman. Stay tuned. Taped with Rabbi Doug is next. We're gonna see Rabbi Doug. We're gonna see Rabbi Doug. We're gonna see Rabbi Doug on your TV tonight. But Daddy, I wanna watch Monday Night Football. Forget about Monday Night Football. There's no other thing we're gonna watch on Monday but Rabbi Doug. Yeah, Rabbi Doug on TV tonight. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. Oh, how many money talk about that? Shalom and welcome to Taped with Rabbi Doug. Glad you could be with us today. My guest today is Dr. Charles Middleton. He is the president of Roosevelt University in Chicago. Welcome to the show, Chuck. It's very good to be with you this evening. I Daddy. had the great pleasure of meeting Chuck at uh, the Auditorium Theater during the True Colors tour uh, that was a fundraiser and... Uh, it was a great concert and uh, just happened to be right there where you were and we met and I'm glad you agreed to come to the show because I think that Roosevelt University is, is such a pillar in Chicago. It is, first of all, the alma mater of both my mother and my father. Both of them have their bachelor's degrees from there. Both of them uh, were teachers for many, many years. Uh, and in, in Chicago and I think that uh, a lot of people don't realize especially from my parents' generation, that people didn't go to college so much, in the, people who are in their 70s. If you go to the average person on the street, some, some did, some didn't, some did, some didn't. But for those who did go to college, a lot of Chicagoans who grew up in Chicago and stayed in Chicago went to Roosevelt University because it was the premier university in the city. It was right here. And, and people went, and uh, just in every career in every place around you find people went to roosevelt now roosevelt has how many branches in the chicago area we have two branches, two uh, branches. Uh, one downtown in the auditorium theater building the famous building with uh, lots of history attached to it and then we have a separate campus in schomburg uh, next to the woodfield mall and across from the ikea now i actually um had at one time myself in college looked at classes there how many people actually attend in the in the branch campus the campus uh, this current semester has about 2,600 students 2,600. And how many people are registered in the university right now total? 7,500, counting a growing number of people who are registered exclusively online. Oh, so there are people who are actually taking classes exclusively online. Uh, yes, and there are many people that are getting Roosevelt degrees today who have never been to Chicago and will graduate without ever coming to Chicago. That is wild. That is wild. Now, Roosevelt University has uh, actually been... Uh, an accredited university since when? We were accredited immediately after we were founded in 1945, 19th and we've been accredited continuously since then. Very nice, very nice. What other universities uh, existed in Chicago? And, and, and I'm not saying that you need to know all these answers that I'm asking, but do you know what other universities ex existed in Chicago at the time that, you, that Roosevelt uh, was accredited in 1945? Well, there were, for starters, far fewer than there are today. Of Higher education has grown considerably in Chicago. And, for example, in the loop alone, there are 23 universities and colleges operating even as we speak. 23. In fact, the loop is the second largest university town in the country, uh, given the territory that it covers, uh, larger than any other university town in, uh, anywhere, including the big mega universities like Texas and Minnesota and so forth. 55,000 students a day go to school down there. Wow. But to go back to your original question, uh, of course, the University of Chicago and Northwestern were here. Uh, DePaul, Loyola uh, were here as well when Roosevelt was founded in 1945. Circle was the University of Illinois have a Chicago. The University of Illinois had a, a had some courses that it offered on Navy Pier, but it didn't offer a full range of uh, of programs that came in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Now, the big question that I have about Roosevelt itself is. How many people have graduated from Roosevelt University with degrees? Do you have any idea? Yes, just slightly over 70,000 in our 65, uh, nearly 65-year history. Wow. Uh, and most of those people are still alive. Uh, you find that uh, over the course of our history, uh, I would say probably 90% of the people who earn degrees are still with us, and that's really terrific to have that big and strong alumni base like your parents, which it, is really good. It, re it really is, and they're proud to be uh, graduates of Roosevelt University. Um, Roosevelt University is probably the most passed by located uh, university of all the universities in the loop because of its corner location right there at Congress and, and Michigan. What do you think 
uh, was the original plan for the university when they first were putting it together. Now, it's named after President and Mrs. Roosevelt. Is that not correct? That's correct. It's named after FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt. And the original plan actually wasn't to go on the corner of Congress and uh, Michigan Avenue. The first building the university occupied and actually rented was on Wells Street. And we stayed there a year, but in the course of that year, the auditorium building came available on the market. And thanks to the generosity of the supporters of the university, which included Marshall Field and some other prominent local people, we were able to purchase the auditorium uh, theater building uh, for a reasonable price uh, in 1945, and we, late 1945, and we occupied it in 1946. Now, when Roosevelt purchased the auditorium theater, it was in shambles, and the university didn't have the money to to you know, put it all back together and, and rehab it. How did all that come together that the, that the auditorium theater, uh, you know, came to be used again? And, and how did all that money get raised? Because I know it had really fallen apart and, and no one was taking care of it back It was then. in pretty bad shape at the end of the Second World War, and it had essentially been empty for 20 years, uh, with some use during the war uh, by USO uh, troops for such things as a bowling alley, for example, in the theater. Uh, what we did, uh, what the pioneers did, is they literally got down on their hands and knees and scrubbed the stairways, and they swept faculty, students, administrators alike. And they're, the alumni from that period tell these amazing stories of having cleaning days where they would actually go through the building in various parts and prepare it for classes the next week or open up new sections of the building that hadn't yet been prepared uh, as classes expanded. And it became part of a community building exercise. When did it actually, and, and I'm going to guess because I did do a little bit of research, that it must have been in the, in the 70s become the big play, place to go for plays and concerts and stuff? When did it become what it is kind of today, the premier concert hall and, and, and theater? Well, the theater, for starters, is the largest, has the largest stage in Chicago, and it's this amazing uh, structure that has 4,000 seats, and we use it today for a whole variety of concerts and venues. Uh, the university didn't use it from 1946 until about the early to mid-1960s when it was clear that the theater either had to be renovated or it was going to fall down. Mm -hmm. uh, so they had a campaign in the 1960s to raise enough money for the fir what we call the first renovation, uh, and they opened the theater in 1968 uh, and continuously then operated it until today. So it was the 19, late 1960s. Late 1960s. I knew I was a young boy, and so I thought it was early 70s, so I wasn't too far off. Uh, tell me this. When university took it over and, and, and things such as that, what were the first things that actually came in there? Do you know? Uh, you know, when it first opened, reopened in, in the late 1960s, any famous acts early in the early on? The executive director of the theater, who's been back through the records, says that with the exception of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, every significant act and individual performer in uh, the history of American music since 1968 has performed at least once in the auditorium theater. That's wild. I mean, I, just to like a handful of people, I can think, I've been there so many times, but you know, people like I've seen Bob Dylan there, I've seen Steely Dan there, I've seen so many acts there. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's an enjoyable, I rem, you know, the very first, I remember one of the very first concerts I went to there uh, uh, when I was... Uh, probably in my early 20s. I think I went there as a teenager a couple of times, but when I was in my early 20s, I saw Julian Lennon, the son of John Lennon, on his very first yeah. tour when, it, when his first uh, album came out. I went to the Auditorium Theater. It, it's just... Uh, it's, it's a, the structure, the beauty of it. Tell me, Frank Lloyd Wright was involved in the in the construction and the and the uh, designing, along with the main people. And who were they? Well, the building itself as a whole is an Adler and Sullivan. Adler building. and Sullivan, right? And Frank Lloyd Wright was a young draftsman just beginning his career when the building was designed. And there are elements in the building that are clearly early Frank Lloyd Wright, Prairie style, influenced by, of course, the, the great architect of the 19th, early 20th century in Chicago, Louis Sullivan. Adler was a remarkable man because his father was a cantor, and, and Adler had perfect pitch, and he created in the auditorium theater an acoustically perfect building. Uh, you can sit on the uh, last row of the third balcony, which is six floors up, and have a conversation with somebody on the stage, raising your voice no more than you and I are, and 
perfectly understand each other. Uh, it's, uh, it's a really amazing uh, feat of engineering that created the Auditorium Theater, and it makes it, therefore, one of the best places for performers to actually be in because they, they can just do so much more with their voices, with their instruments, than they could do in any other venue. It's, it is a national landmark, isn't that correct? That's correct. The whole building is, yeah. not just the theater, mm -hmm. but the, the building itself is actually three components. Uh, the theater is about 40% of it, but the front part was a, was a uh, hotel uh, where people stayed when they were coming to the theater, and then the back part was an office building uh, where they housed various people from attorneys to businesses and so forth. Uh, the plan was really for the profits of the hotel and the profits of the office building to subsidize the theater so that the people of Chicago would have theater and Chicago could prove to the world that it wasn't a cow town uh, out in the muddy uh, flats around Lake Michigan, but it was a real city. Pre-university, we're speaking Oh, of. way pre-university, <laughs> way pre, uh, probably way pre-Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt right. was in the minds of the people who created it. Uh, wonderful. Um, now, when, when you think of the Auditorium Theater, for example, I think of Chicago Theater, and the reason is because the architecture and the beauty inside of those two places, in my mind, are the two most beautiful theaters in the world. I, I've never been to theaters like the two of them. Are there, are there any similarities or connections between the, the design of those two places? I don't believe so, other than, of course, one theater always influences another whenever you're doing construction. I think if you go to the Loop, you find that there are many wonderful venues uh, some of them quite large and some of them uh, relatively small. And so that theater in Chicago is actually one of the most robust industries that we have here today. Wonderful. Well, you know, I'm, I'm so excited because we are going to show uh, some pieces from uh, the documentary, The Auditorium Theater, which is just amazing, and I think our uh, audience will enjoy it too. So stay with us here on Tape with Rabbi Doug. I'm here with Charles Middleton, Ph.D., the president of Roosevelt University, and we'll be back after we take a look at The Auditorium Theater. Louis Sullivan taught that an act of creation is the ability to synthesize all a person knows and abstract that knowledge emotionally. The auditorium building in Chicago has proven an incomparable abstraction of its architects, Louis Sullivan and Dankmar Adler. And despite numerous demolition attempts, it remains the only one of their buildings left standing that Frank Lloyd Wright also worked on. The auditorium building was born out of the democratic notions about culture for the many. And now, more than a hundred years later, it's still a live democratic idea in its present use as home to a, a city university committed to the vision of democratic ideals. I'm Studs Terkel, and it's my delight to tell you the story itself, the story of the dreamers who turned 19th century romantic thought and democratic ideas into harmonious action. The doers who took a white elephant and turned it into a city university. And the other long dead soldiers and writers, musicians, politicians, scholars, businessmen, and dissenters who left their marks on this building. In November of 1873, Two years after the fire, a Louis Sullivan arrived in Chicago with one year at MIT and experience as a draftsman in Philadelphia. From his first glimpse of the prairie and the lake, Sullivan thrilled with the opportunity of rebuilding Chicago. He had big plans for himself, and in Chicago, big was the word of the day. Bigger was even better, and biggest in the world was the braggart phrase of every Chicago ton. After all, Chicago had the biggest fire in the world at that time. It was the biggest grain and lumber market in the world. It slaughtered more animals than any city in the world. And most important, it was the greatest railroad center in the world. Sullivan wrote that Chicago shouted itself hoarse and reclaimed. He also wrote that he found the shouters to be the crudest, rawest, most savagely ambitious dreamers and would-be doers in the world. He admired them and immediately joined them in rebuilding this city of the big shoulders. The German-born Dankmar Adler 
came to the United States with his father when he was 10 years old. His name was assumed to be a combination of the German, Dank, for thanks, and the Hebrew Mar, for bitter, as his mother had died in childbirth. In 1861, he moved to Chicago with his father, who became a rabbi of what is now called Congregation K.A.M. Isaiah Israel, while Dankmar studied architecture. A year later, Dankmar enlisted in the Union Army and eventually worked as a draftsman. After the war, Adler established an independent practice in Chicago and became known for his engineering and acoustical genius. As fate would have it, Louis Sullivan found the mentor he sought in Dankmar Adler and went from employee to partner in a few short years. Adler. Stolid. German. Uh, an engineer, a Civil War hero, a Jew who never had the blessings of a mother. During their 14-year partnership, they completed over 200 projects and were responsible for an overwhelming number of architectural innovations. Louis Sullivan, a poetic Irish genius, a man given to surrendering to his passions. He did not underrate himself. A man of temper, a man completely unsuited to dealing in the business world. But while Sullivan and Adler were designing homes on Chicago's south side, the auditorium building actually began as the dream of Ferdinand Peck, a wealthy and connected patron of the arts. Hardly a Chicagoan that hasn't been touched by the beauty of this theater. I must have been a very young girl, and I remember being impressed with the lights, which are really unusual. And if you stand in the front of the auditorium and you look up, it's really very impressive. I think that I saw Romeo and Juliet there when I was either in college or shortly out of it, when Vivian Leigh and Laurence Olivier were madly in love and for some reason, we had seats in the first row. It was probably one of the most impressive love scenes I've ever seen. Thanks to Marshall Field, they were able to purchase uh, this decaying national historic landmark, the Auditorium Theater Building, and refurbish enough of it to make it useful as a, uh, as a university campus. Uh, Roosevelt uh, was actually an oasis in a desert uh, in a time when blacks were really... Uh, locked out of most schools, if not all schools, except for very small quarters. The only major architectural alteration to the building was made in 1952, when traffic engineers widened Congress Parkway to handle traffic from the new Eisenhower Expressway. To accommodate the widening of the street, the sidewalk outside the building's southern end was removed and relocated inside an arcade constructed the length of the building. As special funds have been made available by individual, corporate, and foundation donors, certain of the more architecturally significant rooms have been restored by Roosevelt University. In 1967, the beautifully restored auditorium reopened for a performance of the New York Ballet, performing A Midsummer Night's Dream. Throughout the 60s and 70s, the auditorium theater became one of the premier rock houses in the world as is reflected in this commercial from the period. A lot of great performers have appeared at the Auditorium Theater, from symphony orchestras to the electric light orchestra, the jazz of Herbie Hancock to the sounds of Fleetwood Mac, Jackson Brown and Bruce Springsteen, the blues of Muddy Waters, even Pink Floyd. Yet isn't it interesting that only one major Chicago FM station cares enough to play music by all of them? Listen to the variety. When I came w to the Auditorium Theater, it was in use about 85 days and it had a several hundred thousand dollar deficit. It was one of the most famous rock and roll houses in the country so the building was in a state of disrepair. 
um, I should say rather neglected maintenance. I felt that 4,000 seats at the corner of Michigan and Congress in a theater as beautiful as that one couldn't possibly fail if it were presented correctly and marketed correctly and cleaned up. The auditorium building was placed on the National Register of Public Places. It has been declared a Chicago as well as a national historic landmark and pronounced to be of national significance in commemorating the history of the United States of America. I'm Peter Yarrow of Peter Polinari, sometimes known as Puff the Magic Dragon, and I'm hiding the great face of Rabbi Doug. Watch him, Rabbi Doug. It's a wonderful show. Welcome back. We're here at Taped with Rabbi Doug, and I'm here with Charles Middleton, Ph.D. He is the president of Roosevelt University in Chicago. Um, what is the philosophy? And by the way, the auditorium is beautiful, isn't, isn't it? Isn't it it's terrific? Just it I really could is. look at that film forever. Um, tell, what is the philosophy? You know, a, a university that is a not-for-profit has to be able to fund itself, and I'm sure there are a lot of uh, benefactors and people who donate to keep the university afloat because I'm sure tuition is kept as low as possible to keep a nonprofit university open. What is the philosophy of Roosevelt University? Well, for starters, uh, we are the only university with the possible exception of another that actually reduced our tuition in the last five years uh, compared to what it was a year before. So we're very conscious of the cost of higher education because our basic philosophy is that Roosevelt needs to be available to people from all par parts of this metropolitan area and from all walks of life. Uh, and nonetheless, we still have to provide a very high quality education, so that costs a certain amount of money. So there's a tension between keeping costs low and providing high quality, and we think that we optimally do that at Roosevelt. Wonderful. You know, uh, Dr. Charles Middleton looks a lot younger than he really is, um, and, and I'm not saying that age-wise. I'm talking about you have an unbelievable history in your career. Can you tell us, where did you go to school? How does one end up being the president of a university? And where, where did you work before you came to Roosevelt? Well, my mother says she dropped me off at college to, uh, when I was 17, and I never left school, and that's an actually true statement. I was an undergraduate at Florida State in Tallahassee, Florida, and then I have an MA and PhD uh, from Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. Really, very nice. And where were you, how did you end up building up to being the president of Roosevelt? Uh, what were you doing uh, before you came here? And how long have you been here, about five years? I'm beginning my sixth year at Roosevelt mm -hmm. University, and I'm a professor of history here and everywhere else I've been. I spent the first 27 years of my career as a professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder, where many people from this area actually were my students. So I know people... Uh, who actually came from here to go to CU to go and studied history with me. Yeah. Uh, and then I went to Bowling Green in Ohio, the University of Maryland, and then I came to Roosevelt. My very, very close friend and uh, who I worked with, colleague for many years, Dr. Henry Roth, was the um, uh, director of the uh, Therapeutic Day School in Duke University mm -hmm. uh, before he came to Chicago. And then he was running the Jewish Children's Bureau Therapeutic Day School. Now he's at the University of Chicago Orthogenic School. He's the executive director. So it's just interesting how people build up in their careers from place to place. Did, did you ever, in your um, field of, of in education, think that you would end up being the president of a school, uh, you know, running a whole university? It's a really, it's a lot of responsibility, obviously, and, and a lot of people, even if they're qualified, probably wouldn't take it. What what, what brought you to this and, and kind of had you apply or had them come to you and say, we're interested in you? What was the, the, the draw? Well, I see myself as an educator, and uh, in that sense, uh, I just sort of followed my interest uh, over the course of my career. Uh, tried to contribute in every way that I could. I was asked to do one thing and then another, and gradually uh, the opportunity came to come to Roosevelt University in Chicago. Uh, I was asked to apply here. I was not looking for a job uh, at that time. I was quite content where I was in Maryland. Uh, but when I found out what a terrific place this is, and particularly the values of inclusiveness and openness that helped to find it, uh, it's, it's way from the beginning, so that people could go to school in Chicago when we were created who were not allowed to go anywhere else because of their race or their religion or their national origin. And Roosevelt said, no, you can come with us. And I said to myself, why wouldn't I want to work to carry on that tradition uh, and to celebrate those values for the future? Now, you're a good PR man because you've been able to answer every question I asked. Do you have any idea possibly on the 
split between male and female population nowadays at, at, at Roosevelt? Because that's always, you know, if you looked at it 20 years ago, the male population was much higher in, in university life than it was uh, of female population. How is it today and how is it at Roosevelt? I actually know the numbers. Uh, Forty okay. years ago, uh, in 1968, two-thirds of our students were male and one-third of the students were female. Today, it's exactly the reverse of that. Wow, more females than males. And that's very common in higher education, particularly in institutions like Roosevelt that do not have uh, a wide array of science and technology programs. Uh, so the curriculum itself det helps to determine the balance uh, in most places. I believe my parents both graduated in 1959. Uh, they both graduated the same year from from Roosevelt, so well, and, and a lot of their yeah. and a lot of their friends went to Roosevelt too. It was an interesting thing that uh, friends from high school. Um, my father graduated from Austin High School on the west side. My mother graduated from Van Steuben on the north mm -hmm. side, and a lot of their friends went to Roosevelt. It was just something that uh, a lot of people did in in their classes and 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 graduated from there. Um, well, you what? know, I will say that it, that those traditions actually were very important in the 50s and 60s, and, they're, and they continue to be important today. Uh, you know, there's something about going to school with your classmates and look at your parents met at Roosevelt, uh -huh. and uh, you're here. Yeah, and here I am. <laughs> what is your vision for the future, um, briefly? I mean, you're here now in your sixth year. Obviously, things are going well. Um, you want things to go better. You always want things to go better. You want to be remembered for making your mark I in your tenure in the school. What is your vision for the future while you're with Roosevelt University and maybe even after you retire or, or, or move on? Well, let me tell you what we collectively want to do okay. and what we're working as a community to mm -hmm. do. We're doing two things. We're providing open opportunity for students who want to come and study the curricula that we offer, and we're doing it at an affordable price, and we're doing it at a very high quality. So we're combining access with academic excellence, and we think that we're creating the next generation of leaders for Chicago, for the suburban communities around Chicago, and for the businesses and professions that uh, they will pursue in those communities, and for the benefit of themselves and their families as well. Okay, one big question again that's, that's on my mind that I wanted to ask you tonight. What is the um, largest percentage of career uh, people that leave the university, meaning what career do they go into? What, is, there, is there a statistic on that? Most of our students ultimately wind up in some kind of business, although education and numbers of teachers is very high behind that. And increasingly, more and more people are going to graduate school and getting PhDs and, or MDs and going into the professions. Really? Very good. What is the highest degree that the university offers? We offer two doctoral programs, one in clinical psychology and one in educational leadership for the schools. That is amazing. I, I can't tell you how wonderful it's been to have you on the show. This has Thank been so you. informative. Been I didn't know half the things I knew about Roosevelt University until I met you, and it has absolutely been a, a, a pleasure. I wish you much success with your career with Roosevelt University and the continued success of the Auditorium Theater, which in my mind is one of the most beautiful places in Chicago. Uh, if you have never been to the Auditorium Theater for a play, for a concert, for an event, it's, it's definitely worthwhile to go and be sure if things are playing in different venues to catch them while they're at the Auditorium because it is an amazing place. Uh, how high up is the highest uh, six floors. It's the six sixth floor, floor, correct. Six stories. And thank up. you, Doug, for having me on. And uh, hi to your mom and dad as alumni uh, of the university. Thanks so much. Thank I want to thank once again my guest, Dr. Charles Middleton, the president of Roosevelt University. I want to thank all of you for being with us. Remember to check out our website, www.tvrabbi.com. And you can check out our shows on the internet on the link right there at the website or you can email us if you have any questions if you have any questions for Dr. Middleton I'll be happy to pass them on to him and forward them to him info at tvrabbi.com once again thank you Dr. Charles Middleton you, President Roosevelt University thank all of you hope to see you next time right here on Taped with Rabbi Doug Shalom yeah, I'm talking about Rabbi Doug talking about Rabbi Doug talking about Rabbi Doug on your TV show well, he's the rabbi for me Anytime you need You're gonna get married or you're gonna die You're gonna see Rabbi Doug